Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our session. The time is 6.03 p.m. Thank you all very much for coming out. I see a lot of neighborhoods represented. Welcome to Neighborhood Day uh, here at Free Paper. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have lots of neighborhood pride. That's wonderful. Um, and so we have set up several citizens signed up to speak uh, this evening. Uh, individuals will have three minutes, and groups will have uh, an allocation up to nine minutes. And so I'll start by recognizing the first person signed up to speak. Uh, I will recognize also the next person in line who can be prepared to come forward to the podium. So we'll start with Grace Rosales, followed by a group speaking on behalf of neighborhoods. That's Velma Pena, Cynthia Spielman, and Colleen Wagenstein. Closer to the mic. It is agenda item C7. Microphone? No, it's off. Microphone? Again, it concerns a zoning change uh, request for a It is agenda item Z number uh, number C7. Uh, the subject home is 1622 West Wiesach. It's District 1. I live at uh, 1623 West Wiesach. I've uh, been there uh, 25 years. Uh, myself and neighbors, and I've got a lot of uh, forms there, respectfully requested that uh, request be denied. Uh, prior to the uh, Zoning Commission Board meeting, which on, uh, I have been in contact with the case manager, Michael Pepe, and since then I've been in contact with uh, District 1's uh, zoning and planning director, uh, Tydell Brooks. I researched OHP's uh, statement of significance and discovered numerous instances of erroneous and inaccurate and misleading information that leads one to wonder what actually is behind all this uh, request for uh, HLD. I submitted my findings to Mr. Brooks, who later informed me that corrections were being made and these corrections were uh, would be in the materials that would be forwarded to the city council. Uh, but though that was not what was passed by the zoning commission. Uh, of more importance and long-range concern uh, is the frivolous use of number three in the criteria for the evaluation. The subject house uh, is the, the home of former San Antonio Mayor R. N. White, according to OHP. I looked up that footnote, uh, footnote 10, the only footnote they used to um, you know, testify to who's being mayor. Uh, San Antonio Life, October 21st, 1954, page 2 is what they used. It's an interview with the mayor, uh, his wife, his interest in his cars, his liking scenic drives, on and on. It makes you wonder, though, why didn't they use page one, the headline, all caps? And I'll read it. Uh, White Senior, third mayor of 1954, replaces son on council. San Antonio's third mayor of 1954, uh, R.M. White Senior, Thursday took the oath of office minutes after being named a city councilman to replace his son. His son, R.M. White Jr., resigned rather than to face a recall election. And so then Sr. is appointed a councilman to replace that vacancy of his son's uh, place six then. Uh, and minutes later, as the first paragraph states, minutes later, he is appointed uh, mayor for six months. Huh, is that interim? Does that mean I'm done? Thank you very much, Ms. Rosales. We have a group now. The Tier 1 Neighborhood Coalition, Velma Pena, Cynthia Spielman, Colleen Weitzman. And the group will be followed by Nazarene Ruben Flores Pettis. Good evening.
Good evening, uh, council members and mayor. Uh, before my remarks, uh, I would first like to just take a moment and give our condolences to the family of the San Antonio firemen, uh, Greg Garza, on behalf of the neighborhood associations that are here today. My name is Velma Pena from District 5. Today, neighborhoods throughout the city welcome you to the new council year. What we share is that we believe that people who live in San Antonio neighborhoods should have a voice in the decisions made about our neighborhoods and communities. We have a right to make important choices as we face the challenges of the future. We are here to remind you that we are your constituents, we are your voters. <coughs> Tier 1 Neighborhood Coalition and Neighborhoods Coalitions and allies across the city stand together. We advocate for common sense and compatible development of our neighborhoods that includes respect and includes the respect of the local community of the local existing community. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Mary Burke and council members, thank you for this opportunity to, to address you today. Uh, welcome to our new council members. Um, and I very much appreciate those of you who chose to stay and listen to your constituents. I notice we have a number of empty seats, including a couple from the north side. So <laughs> thanks for, to each of you for caring enough about your community to engage in public ser service. Certainly, it isn't for the pay. My name is Colleen Wagspath. I'm current president of Northside's Neighborhood for Organized Development. You may ask yourselves, what is a representative from the north side doing standing here next to residents from the inner core of San Antonio? This isn't about whether a neighborhood is on the west side or the north side, urban center or the suburbs. Our neighborhoods each have unique challenges and opportunities. However, we share a common commitment to protecting the integrity of our neighborhoods. In January of this year, City Council took steps to increase governmental transparency and accountability. The city has made progress towards this goal with the expansion of SA Speak Up initiative and taking city council sessions on the road. However, it is important that city leaders are listening, not just checking boxes that X number of public meetings were held. Too often, residents still feel that decisions are made before all public input has been obtained. So as you sit listening to citizen input at council each week or during a public meeting, we ask that you listen with an open mind. We know your job is difficult and that you often have to make decisions which benefit one group to the expense of the other, and you can never please all. However, as you listen to citizen input, you might just hear that one hidden grain which will lead to a greater understanding of or solution to an issue. Our neighborhoods, regardless of their age or location, embody the history, culture, and character of San Antonio. San Antonio is not Houston, Austin, Chicago, or while we need to examine best practices from other communities, it is important that we find solutions that work for our community. Every decision the council makes affects our, our lives, our communities, and our quality of life. As we plan for the growth of our city, we will all have to adapt to accommodate that growth. However, it is important that we maintain the rich diversity and heritage that makes San Antonio San Antonio. Today, we are here to remind our city leaders that as our city prepares for this coming growth, the voices of those who call San Antonio home today still matter. Thank you.
20, 85, 26. 20 represents the difference in life expectancy by zip code here in San Antonio. 85 is $85,000. That's the difference, in, that's the income inequality between our wealthiest neighborhood in Shavano Park and our neighborhood with the fewest resources, financial resources on the east side. 26 is percentage point difference in uh, adults, uh, white adults and Latinx adults in terms of having a high school diploma here in San Antonio. These disparities are not new, you're familiar with them, but the reason I point them out is because they require planning, they require policy, and they require good leadership. They won't fix themselves. They require the kind of leadership that you showed recently in passing the paid sick time ordinance. Thank you. They require the kind of leadership that you've shown in tackling affordable housing, and they require the kind of leadership that I hope you will demonstrate tomorrow as you pass the Climate Action Adaptation Plan. The, the thing I want to point out about that, though, is that tomorrow is not championship day. There will be no trophies passed out, not even any participation medals because the real work is still ahead of us. Tomorrow kicks off the beginning of the impl implementation process, hopefully, if it, is, if it is passed, when more of your leadership will be required, because these are long-term challenges that require long-term thinking and vision, and they require your vision, and they require your courage, most of all. Courage because we know that CPS Energy needs more democracy. To continue to think that we can burn coal for another 40 years is not acceptable. Courage because we know that equity has been included in the plan, but needs to really truly be at the heart of the plan. It requires a shift in power and decision making. It requires us to think not only about who benefits, but who is burdened, and to make sure there is equity there. This kind of courage does not necessarily build your donor base, but I don't think that's why you got into politics to begin with. So tomorrow, and in the days and months and years to come, I encourage you, ask you, beg you to be courageous in your leadership to ensure that all residents of our city can reach their full potential regardless of their race, regardless of their neighborhood, regardless of their income or education level by passing the cap. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barr. Peter Barr, and Lisa Peace. Mr. Mayor, Council. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you. My name is Pete Bella, and uh, what Tim said, I will follow up with. On the other half, he spoke well in terms of his requests to council and the need for the passing of the Climate Action Adaptation Plan. I'm on the side of the Climate Ad Action Adaptation Plan that says we appreciate it, we want to support it, we know that it needs to be passed, and we'll be pushing to make sure that it's as stringent and as forward-thinking as it needs to be. So. I would also um, say that we consider tomorrow to be the shot, the starting shot that begins the race to see that climate action plan achieved the way it needs to be achieved. So you can look to us as your faithful allies in the process of making the climate action plan the reality. It must be for San Antonio's sake. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Annalisa Peace, followed by Greg Plum. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm speaking for Annalisa Peace. I'm, what, I'm sorry, what's your name, ma'am? You, you do have to be present. Uh, you don't have to be signed up to, in order to speak. Uh, um, thank you, Annalisa Peace's place. Is yeah, that but possible? You have to be signed up in order to speak. Is Annalisa here? No, she Are you signed up? Okay, unfortunately you won't be able to speak then. I understand, thank you. Okay. Um, Greg Harmon. Mr. Harmon, you'll be followed by Juliana Klein. Am I doing two or three? Uh, I just want to say, confession, I'm coming into this room uh, working to cultivate a belief that all of us in here uh, are here in common concern, uh, working for our city as a whole, our communities, our families, um, but I also find that uh, that conviction uh, strained, deeply strained, when I see the use of bad data, unjustified economic forecasts, falsehoods, whisper campaigns, and the cruelty of willful ignorance of climate science settled for over 100 years by the San Antonio Chamber, the 
Valero Energy, uh, Manufacturers Association, and sadly, Councilman Perry, who's not here to be here. Uh, and we all read his editorial this morning, making use of all of that, uh, as well as some of our county leaders. Uh, these place profits over people, profits that jeopardize, uh, that are already jeopardized, to be swept away in our own failure to prepare if we don't pass the climate plan. Uh, the correct start of this conversation is not in the dollars category. It's within a confession that we are in a period of global climate crisis, that even if our emissions stop today, San Antonio is in store for 200 or more years of rising temperatures, Deep, stronger storms and deeper floods, and that these are things that if we refuse to act on, if we continue to delay or de deny, is to agree that these extreme hazards are worth the security of an imagined economic future, the future of growth. And the saddest thing that I've seen through this whole process these last two years is to see council members from some of our poorest districts to come to accept uh, the logics, these false logics of the oil and gas lobby, who have never placed the well-being a concern for poor folks in our city over their bottom lines. And we can ask the families in Manchester about that, in the shadow of the Valero refinery. The lesson of San Antonio's history, we know, at least from the flood of 21 forward, is that the most vulnerable in our city always pay the greatest price, and will again now, if we fail to act. The reality is, if you look at it more deeply, for those who are, uh, have some uncertainty, this is an equity document that holds that those who are most at risk will receive the greatest investment. And that failing to recognize that simple fact is to tell your constituents that they need to be holding more bake sales. That when their grandparents are hospitalized in heat stroke or their homes are washed away, they'll need to turn to Kickstarter rather than the city of San Antonio for hope of recovery. To deny the needs of our most vulnerable for the toxic rhetoric of the most powerful is the ultimate betrayal of your office. And again, I wish uh, Perry were here to hear this today. I hope others who may be on the fence will take this to heart. But we will remember that these turns against the most vulnerable and beyond a shadow of climate doubt, we will center this conversation in the mouth of the storm. For those who Thank you. Thank you so much. Followed by Wendell Fuqua. Hi, my name is Juliana Klein, and I'm here uh, on behalf of Camelot One. Can't hear you. And I'm here on behalf of the zoning case D 2019 which has to do with the Walsam Road revitalization and Dial Ike Road. Um, right now, on the northeast side, we have a disproportionate amount of multifamily housing. And uh, I, I find it really sad that in Camelot one right now, unfortunately, our president of our neighborhood association said, and I quote, it's sad that most Camelot one neighborhood association, or sorry, just residents, choose to avoid the issues of our area. And the problem with this is that no one is notified. So I have started a petition within the past few days, and so far everyone that I have spoken to has not heard about this. So I, I feel something that needs to be corrected maybe in our neighborhood. And um, the reason that I'm opposing this is that, again, we have a disproportionate amount of multi-family uh, housing, but our neighborhood's uh, plan actually states, due to the number of businesses and vacant lots, the substantial amount of multi-family housing, the community wishes to focus on more diverse development to balance the uses in the area. So I respectfully request that this zoning be denied in the, in the hopes that we will continue with the revitalization of the Northeast Side and Walton Road. And I'd like to thank you, Councilwoman, uh, for extending the uh, hearing for tomorrow. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Fruko? Mr. Fruko will be followed by Antonio Diaz. My name is Wendell Fuqua. I live in District 1 in Monta Vista, and I'm a member of the Sierra Club. When this country entered World War II, it entered a battle for its survival. It tooled up for this battle in a matter of months. Pontiac made anti-aircraft guns. 
Cadillac turned out light tanks. All over America, we mobilized for war. We need to do that again in the face of climate change. I applaud our city leaders for being on the brink of passing a climate action and adaptation plan, or CAP, but I caution that the CAP is only an outline. It's only as good as our mobilization effort will be. And one of the key players in our plan, City Public Service, CPS, which used to be a visionary utility, has turned timid. If it were Cadillac in World War II, it would still be building cars, not tanks. The United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change warns that the world has 10 years to cut its CO2 emissions by 45%, on the way to carbon neutrality by 2050. San Antonio is committed to that goal, but CPS, in its FlexPath plan, contemplates burning coal and gas possibly into the year 2060. That's no path to carbon neutrality. Many cities and states have far more ambitious plans. California has committed to generating 60% of its energy from renewables by 2030 and 100% by 2045. Austin plans to have 65% renewables by 2027. And renewables are cost competitive. A respected power evaluation company said in a recent report, replacing the coal plants with a portfolio of non-emitting resources would likely save money for TPS ratepayers. Our coal and gas plants produce 48% of San Antonio's emissions. Shut them down, and we meet our goal of reducing emissions by 45% by 2030. And there's a bonus to closing the coal plants, our health. Particulates from burning coal contribute substantially to cases of asthma, heart problems, and pulmonary problems, especially among the young and the old Put simply, coal kills. If we shut down our coal plants, we improve public health. Unlike Cadillac or Pontiac, companies that switched overnight to making tanks and anti-aircraft guns, CPS already knows how to make pollution-free electricity. <coughs> CPS now needs to mobilize for a more visionary plan to stop burning coal and gas. Just like World War II, it's a matter of our survival. Antonio Diaz. Mr. Diaz, are you here? Okay, I think Deanna Ariegas is also here. Okay, we move to a group, the Southwest Workers Union. That's Alice Canistero Garcia, and I'm for Garcia, and Isabel Zapet. They'll be followed by Rose Hill. Action and 
patient side. The plan will also reduce the number of people who die prematurely every year here in San Antonio, 52 a year, because of our poor air quality. So let's pass the climate action and adaptation plan. This message is intended to inspire those who might need a reason to vote yes. You may have heard that the very young and the elderly are most at risk from the cold in the air, which leads to asthma and even lung, lung cancer. So let's pass the climate action and adaptation plan. I'll just say it with me too. It will improve the quality of life and could even stop human extinction. So let's pass the climate action and adaptation plan. Thank you. Buenas noches, good evening. My name is Isabel Cepeda. And currently, I'm five months pregnant. As I grow the seed inside of me, I question whether San Antonio is a healthy and safe space for my baby to grow in. I recognize this comes with privilege to be able to even think of moving away from pollution. It's not something everyone can, and it's not something anyone should be forced to do. But let's not only think about babies and children. What about our elders, adults, youth? the water, plants, and animals in San Antonio. I also ask you to think about those folks that have been here for thousands of years, like our Native American, the Native American community of San Antonio. How will your vote tomorrow honor their health? How will your vote tomorrow honor the health of all of the families in San Antonio? How will your vote honor your own family's health here in San Antonio? How will your vote honor the earth? What kind of legacy will you leave? One that prioritizes money, businesses, and extractive companies, or one that honors life, earth, and community? Please pass the adaptation plan. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, we have uh, Rose Hill. Ms. Hill, you'll be followed by Antonio Diaz.
and right now we're taking baby steps. The councilwoman on September 14, 2019, at our, at our presence meeting, she and her staff did their homework and gave us a detailed update on that book we gave her. I failed to mention those items were taken. So here are the accomplishments from this group. We put a plan in place and it worked. Second, we are organizing registered neighborhoods to come that have gone dormant. Park Village is the first one that came alive. And today I would like to acknowledge real quickly Park Village. Raise your time. East Village, Cadillac One, Sunrise, Wilshire, Woodwick, Maggie Park, Jefferson Heights, Kruger, Salado Creek, Government Hill, and Eastwood Village. Thank you for all coming together to make our district feel good. And, and Eastwood, Eastwood, uh, Eastwood Village. Hello, my name is uh, Joseph Johnson, and uh, District 2 has become a unified base. We have actually talked about zoning, we've talked about uh, the neighborhood stacking. When I use the term stacking, I'm talking about the overpopulation of some areas in the neighborhoods. We've also talked about uh, the population and what we would actually like to do in zoning is to ensure that when we talk about zoning, that we actually have something that is beneficial to the community, not just to an individual that wants to buy into zoning. And then their number, they, they talk about the number of jobs that you get, but then they reduce those jobs in zoning. I'd also like to talk about uh, Sunrise. Sunrise neighborhood is a neighborhood that has changed over the last two years. With the help of city officials, with the help of police, <coughs> with the help of uh, Ms. Jada and a number of officials, Sunrise is not or any longer considered Gunrise. That is one name that is stuck with Sunrise based upon the number of people that came from different areas in 93 to 95. When they closed down, a number of those uh, other areas Victoria Courts, all those disenfranchised areas, when they closed them down and brought them into Sunrise, where they were supposed to actually be dispersed over the city. And they saw an opportunity to bring them into one area. So for the last two, three years of Sunrise, we have actually gotten rid of a number of people, a lot of things that <coughs> made the turn gun rise, go away, and become sunrise. Uh, with the help of uh, the city officials, as I said earlier, uh, the neighborhoods have changed. Our neighborhood has changed. It has become a better and prosperous neighborhood. And we have the contention to still try to make it better based upon what we have. So, uh, I can <coughs> a number of uh, situations that has come into Sunrise, just speaking for my area, based upon D2. I'm proud of being a member of D2 and actually forming D2 and helping form D2 with Ms. Rosen to make D2, District 2, a better place to live. So, for my time, thank you. Thank you all very much. Okay, Antonio Diaz, followed by Diana Reyes. Y'all going to be together, Antonio? Yes. Okay, go on six minutes. <coughs> see all these people.
not is not a good deal as far as our constitutional right to freedom of speech and freedom to petition our government. Those those things are being impacted by this renovations, the uh, leasing by the GLO of certain buildings. <coughs> Seems to be the only the only outlet for us because, as I explained to the to one gentleman I spoke to throughout the most time, is that uh, Texas pursuing the, its policies of extermination of Native Americans uh, when it was a republic continued with those policies when it became a state on the United States, and and so there's no change. None of us were recognized. Mexicans, Hispanics, or Latinos, but not indigenous. So we, we cannot uh, protect burial sites. We cannot speak out at places where there were our ancestral gathering places for thousands of years. Now we're restricted by government that does not recognize us as Native. So these these uh, Topics, this dialogue has to expand within, again, our municipal government, our state. Our state means this is a very oppressive state. And like I said, it still pursues that eliminating Native people. The way I see it, that we have to acquiesce to uh, a national or a state identity that's been given to us and it won't accept us as what we were prior. That's one subject matter that I, that, I, that I will be pursuing, and the other is uh, I'm very grateful that we finally have a District 2 to represent Sullivan is, is uh, as I told her staff member, has surprised me pleasantly with the way that she direction she's taking uh, the representation of this too, which uh, is, has, is a long time in coming, I think. It, it's had this it bumps along the road, and I think right now it's, it, it, it's reaching a certain peak for, for a district too, and I'm, I'm glad that to, see, to see this, uh, because it's needed. And district 2 right now, Still is facing its challenges because, uh, again, its shortcomings as far as uh, uh, development <laughs> economically. They want to uh, open up a detention center on East Commerce Street. And I don't think it needs that. It, it, it needs employment, but not that. I pushed when I was running for District 2 for more employment at Fort Sam. For more up employment opportunities through that road and through other opportunities that could be created. But when you start thinking of, my mind right away goes to a concentration camp. Uh, I'm pretty sure those people in Germany that had employment <coughs> through those avenues would have wanted other employment. And I'm hoping that that is also the case for the residents that need employment in District 2. Is that they would rather be employed doing something else. Gainfully employed doing something else. There's, I, as I drove down here, I, I see a lot of development. And I'm hoping that with Ms. Sullivan's guidance, that employers over here will start employing the residents located within District 2. There's much talent, as I always 
said when I ran in District 2, and there's no need to seek outside employees. Prioritize hiring within the district before you go elsewhere. Thank you very much, Dr. Kumar. Thank you, everyone. Ross Lovett. So I'll have you be followed by Otis Thompson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. My name is Ross Lovett. I live in District 8. I'm the land use and zoning counsel for the Oakland State Standard. I'm really just here to represent my neighborhood. I'm going to stand with uh, the other neighborhoods here on Neighbor today and thank you to one for the action role it's taken in bringing neighborhood issues to the board. Um, I'd like to congratulate you all on the election, or election as the case may be. And I would like to review that about a year ago I came to Fort Worth Citizens to be heard with some of my neighbors from Oakland States and asked for help uh, passing a neighborhood plan protection ordinance really hasn't gone very far. I was happy to let everybody run for re-election, but I would deeply appreciate consideration of that now to a council consideration request. Um, Manny's not here, so Ron, I guess I'm looking at you and the councilman for video. Um, I'm sure I'll end up tormenting you, for which I apologize, but I think it's a good cause. Um, Open Estates is a veteran neighborhood in uh, the battle for neighborhood preservation. We've been at it really since we were annexed in 1974 because we've been outside the loop since 26. Um, one thing that I really have noticed is with the planning department, in my estimation, pushing for density fairly relentlessly, the burden is falling on the older neighborhoods. This is partly because they probably want density closer to the central urban core, uh, but it's also because most neighborhoods developed since 1970 uh, are primarily gated and they all have very powerful restrictive covenants so that they really can't be invaded with density, uh, whereas the others of us can. So we would appreciate uh, consideration of that ordinance and I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Sanchez, uh, who has been instrumental in, I'll say, keeping neighborhood plans alive, uh, pending the activities of the planning department, uh, but we really would like to be addressed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lawler. Otis Thompson, followed by a group, the Historic West Side Resident Association, that's Terry Castillo, Natalie Guerrero, and Leticia Sanchez. Good evening, everyone. I'm Elder Otis Thompson. I am the Republican Party of Bear County, Precinct Chairman 4036, representing the Dell Press community on the east side. I must also say that I am a straight, heterosexual, alpha male. My goal is to, be is to develop Martin Luther King Park as an international world pilgrimage cultural and heritage tourist destination, like reversing the MLK march from Kippen Sullivan Park to end it at MLK Park at the Wheatley Heights Sports and Entertainment Stadium. The construction of Lake MLK is just as important. The 2005 Wheatley Heights MLK Park Master Plan illustrates the construction of Lake MLK in the area located south of Rice Road at Salado Creek. The 22-acre lake will be supplied water by Salado Creek itself. Lake MLK is expected to be a focal point of the community for outdoor recreation. Funding is now available through the voter-approved $80 million 2015 hotel, hotel venue sales tax. And with that, I ask your support to build Lake MLK. Thank you very much. After that. 
Thank you, Mr. Thompson. For the Stuart Westside Resident Association. Okay. Terry Castillo, Natalie Guerrero, and Matisse Sanchez. They will be followed by Richard Garcia. Two dietary traders, and they're both on the south side. 
I think we want this in Tana and once at Roosevelt, so it would be helpful if we had some in the West Side, Almondale Park, uh, Roosevelt Park. Uh, please don't, you know, we can have some nice church in our area. The second one is like we cordially invite you to our next meeting, uh, our neighborhood meeting, which is going to be Thursday, November the 7th, at the Memorial High School, at the uh, Memorial Branch Mountain Library. Uh, we would like to, uh, for you to attend our meetings if you, if you can possibly can. And also, uh, just wanted just to let you all know that we're proud members of the Westside Neighborhood Association Coalition and also of Tier 1. And again, we will keep advocating and advocating for our neighborhood in the best interest. Thank you very much and have a nice evening. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Mr. Sanchez, I would like to take your time. If I introduce myself and I pass it on to Judith. Uh, Judith is not here. Is, well, Judith is not signed up, so she wouldn't be able to take time. Do you want to take your time? Okay. We'll, we'll move on right now to James Debnow. You see your time, Mr. Debnow? Okay. We have a group. My city is my home. That's Jennifer Acosta, Richard Acosta, and Glenda Alanis. They'll be followed by Evelyn Brown. Hello. And uh, Richard Costa, president of Mi Ciudad es Mi Casa, My City is My Home. Uh, in case you don't know who we are, uh, we're, My City is My Home is a nonprofit organization. Our mission is to educate, support homeowners and renters to increase their housing choices. We receive no city funding, state funding, or federal funding. One of our services is helping homeowners be able to afford to keep their homes by helping them protest their property taxes for free. This year, we saved over $3 million in lower value, tax values and help home, er, uh, homeowners in every single one of your districts. Uh, joining me here are some of our superhero realtors using their special abilities to help out their community. And uh, we are here trying to keep our neighborhoods together and not be taxed out of their homes. Um, I wanted to share with you some data I collected for separate projects. So remember these numbers because you're going to be hearing them again soon. Um, this information was gathered through public record, so it's the city's record, not a, uh, city's data, not our data. Um, since 2012, San Antonio has invested over $90 million into luxury apartments, most if not all through tax abatements. Houston Street uh, Encore at the Riverwalk received $4 million as a pet spa, and I don't know why they needed uh, our money for the $60 million project. Um, I love visiting the Pearl, but I'm not sure if they really needed our $8 million of our taxpayer funds in order to do that. Please think about this when you when someone says that there's not enough money to give homestead exemptions. Think about this when it's too expensive to help out the city uh, homeowners. Um, though I point out these projects, I want uh, to move on and say that we're not against developments. I don't, uh, but I don't think that that has to mean that we are wanting our taxpayer funds to be used for luxury apartments that some of them charge over $2,000 for a one bedroom. Um, once more, not against developments, but against the city not taking, not thinking of homeowners when approving these large uh, developments. After speaking to city planners, city staff, and, the, and going to various presentations for large projects like the San Pedro Park Creek, the UTSA expansion, the opportunity for who zones, uh, no work has been done to ensure the homeowners in the area has their homestead exemptions. Though, as for homestead exemptions goes, there's a multi-four uh, effort including Sacred, uh, Texas Housers, Interface San Antonio Alliance, and much more. We have found that there's over 80,000 homeowners throughout San Antonio that, do, that have not applied for their homestead exemptions. Um, these exemptions they qualify for. Uh, this includes veterans and senior citizens that do not have these exemptions. We are now both, uh, visiting these vulnerable areas and giving them these exemption forms personally. This is an issue on every side of San Antonio. Um, through our mapping, it's throughout uh, homestead exemptions that homeowners haven't applied for. It's preferred in the north side, up the west side, south side, and so on. Um, I've, uh, I, um, sorry about that. Um, this is an issue on every side of San Antonio. We. Uh, why not use just a small part of those millions of dollars to ensure that the homeowners in the areas of the new development has their exemptions? Um, I recently asked this of the Saha Alizan Lofts project. Uh, have they reached out in some way to ensure the homeowners are protected 
from indirect increase of their property tax valuations and ensuring that they have their homestead exemption. The Sawhall staffer at the presentation said that that's up to the council member to do. Though that's probably not the best answer to give, it does make sense. Why doesn't each district uh, 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 in San Antonio, not picking on anyone, does all districts in San Antonio um, have a housing person, and since this is our their top priority, they can work towards the housing issues in that district and ensuring that they're reaching out to the, the homeowners of these large uh, development projects in those areas and ensuring those homeowners have their homestead exemptions. Um, we want to make sure that these people have um, uh, a safe neighborhood and it's affordable. <coughs> affordable to who you might ask, affordable to the people that have lived in those areas before these multi-million dollar projects uh, dropped in their area. As for these improvements projects go, I know it must be difficult for some to understand what we are all what are we all complaining about? Don't we all want new developments in our areas? Um, in these areas that haven't had any infrastructure investments in the decades or for much longer than that, then the city approves a large project, a new road, a new park, and then we come out and complain. The issues is not these developments. And, um, uh, it's less about the developments, but the lack of support to ensure the residents being asked for these basic improvements to be able to afford to enjoy these improvements and not be taxed out of their areas. Also, I want to mention the forgotten population. Mind you, when I speak of supporting neighborhoods, I'm also including the 50% of San Antonio that are our neighbors, our teachers, our police officers, our veterans. They are, are your, uh, they are our and your renters, right? They are also a part of neighborhoods. Remember that, remember that and ask how are you helping them? Currently, if you're a renter living in, in a, a home in an area of town uh, for five years or a decade, they're, they and their landlord gets no help with property taxes. So a law-abiding, ethical landlord with no choice but to raise their rents because their property taxes are raising. Some, rent, uh, some people say renters don't pay property taxes. I say they're correct, and this is only true, if they are renting a luxury apartment that the city gave a 15-year tax abatement to. In the future, I hope that you can think about this and support renters and neighborhoods um, so please treat neighborhoods as you would treat luxury apartment developers. Thank you, Evan. Evan Brown. Ms. Brown, you'd be followed by Charles Pearson. Think about some of the houses that are there. 
poor shape that could be repaired. Mr. Peterson, you'll be followed by Johnny Harris. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Nuremberg and City Council. I would like to encourage you to pass the CAAP, which I think is very important to our future. I agree with people who have spoken before that CAAP does not look like it's strong, as strong as I would like it to be in terms of uh, the uh, phasing out of carbon in our, C in our CPS. I think that's something that we should address. I think looking back, when we, when we look at back at this in the future, no matter what we do, it will not seem like we've done enough. So we should do as much as we possibly can. So, that's my point. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Rose Cohen Brown. Ms. Cohen Brown, you'll be followed by Patrick Von Dillon. Thank you for staying and listening. Um, I live in Beacon Hill, which is in District 1, and I write a column for our local new neighborhood newsletter. And um, I recently turned my attention to um, services for the elderly and have run into a lot of frustrating things when I did that. Um, we have only four um, adult senior centers, um, full service senior centers, which would be fine if there were transportation. But there is no transportation provided to these senior centers, which then shuts out a lot of our senior population. Um, and I do have a vested interest in this, obviously. But um, we used to have a model where families took care of their elders, and that model is breaking down. I don't think we're looking enough at what we can do because of that. Then I turned to looking at the um, meal, the free meals for seniors. And there is a list of the um, places where they're provided. But again, I, when I tried to call and get information, I couldn't get somebody on the phone. You just got voicemail all the time. Um, I also. Um, tried to find out about transportation, and that was even harder to find about transportation that's provided to seniors, other than what uh, VIA does for the uh, disabled. Um, and I found contradictory statements on the city's webpage, um, so that the city is contradicting itself in some of these issues. I, I think the thing, um, services are there. The problem is the information is not provided in a way that seniors will understand and have access to. If I try to do a web search, it's an eternal loop. One website points you to another website, which points you to another website, which points you back to the first website. And you don't even get, get any actual information. So I, I'm asking that you look at your senior policies and find out where you're not communicating with um, your districts and find a way to get that information to seniors who may have a difficult time with our modern forms of communication. Um, and I think that's, that needs to be addressed. Thank you. the opportunity to uh, for citizens to be heard. It's uh, nice to be able to come over here to the East Education Center for, for SA and see what a beautiful building it is and the taxpayer dollars at work. And what a, it's great to have a happy fall. And uh, hopefully we're going to experience some cooler temperatures and uh, we, uh, uh, as we have enjoyed a great summer and uh, some opportunity to, to enjoy the summertime heat and even in the fall. I'm here to talk to you about the San Antonio Climate Action Adaptation Plan. My name is Patrick Von Dolan on behalf of the San Antonio Family Association and uh, hundreds of members 
thousands of supporters to help educate and shine a light on the Climate Action Application Plan. It will require San Antonio to go, go carbon neutral by the year 2050. That's assuming wind and solar will become cost effective without backup power. The San Antonio cap requires that all city vehicles, including via buses, to become electric vehicles. They run great and efficiently on natural gas now. It might be a mistake to change them. The cap will also add tens of thousands of dollars to the cost of buying a new home. CPS Energy has already spent $100 million on solar panel rebates. What we're seeing here now is not is less about the environment and more about policy. And not just policy, but policy overall, overreaching policy that will reach into wealth redistribution and control of citizens. In a national climate assessment, I'm sorry you don't have an overhead projector to see it tonight, but uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there that a heat wave has come upon us. And that statistics have shown since 1960, that's true. But if you go back to the 1900s, you'll see that we're in a lower heat index since, since the actually 1930s. Hidden data also shows that the amount of acreage burned in forest fires has decreased since before 1982. The statistics that people tend to show, as climate activists tend to show, is after 1982. Satellite indexes, by the way, we uh, landed on the moon in 1969, the year I was born, and we've been measuring, the United States has been measuring atmospheric and water activity since that time, since before that time, and missing satellite data that's not shown before 1980 shows that sea, level, uh, sea levels have actually uh, decreased since before the time frame in which uh, the climate act was to show in 1979. I want to read to you something real quick. Satellite observations have been used to map sea ice extent routinely since the 1970s. The, a the American Navy Joint Ice Center has produced weekly charts which have been dis dis uh, disguised, which have been digitized by the, by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric uh, uh, Association. Here's the key. Since 19 about 19 1976, the aerial extent of sea ice in the northern hemisphere has varied about a constant climatological level in 1972-1975, the sea ice extent was significantly less. I'm here to tell you that this climate action plan needs to be delayed and postponed to more scientific data can be entertained. Brett Esparza, followed by Simon Esparza. Good evening, everyone. I'm in uh, District 9, John Courage's district. And uh, I took time to come out here tonight. So if you guys could just get off your phones on council. Hello? We elected you, well, most, not all. But if we did take the time out to come out here, please show some respect and pay attention to what we're saying. You are elected by the citizens of San Antonio. You have a responsibility to listen and to take to heart, professionally, personally, what we are saying. I am born and raised in San Antonio. I serve on the board of Whispering Oaks Homeowners Association. And I work full time. Uh, my biggest concern that I am not in favor of climate change, I'll make that perfectly clear, I wish that we had taken this to a vote for the citizens of San Antonio. I would like to see some ordinances passed, which would, uh, with the growing concern that we have on panhandling all over the city. We have a growing number of issues with trash on our frontage roads, our highways, and in our neighborhoods. 
They've got a growing issue of homeless people. There isn't a place you can go to in San Antonio at any intersection and have four or five people come at you in your car. They're coming at you from the right side, the left side, they're crossing in front of us, and it is becoming dangerous. So I believe that it's time that we step up, and I want to challenge you all to start working together to come up with something that's going to benefit our city. We have a lot of people moving to the state, a lot of people moving to the city. You don't see the crews anymore out there picking up trash. Textile is nowhere to be found. And we've got mattresses and trash. We want to talk about climate change, but, let, but yet we, we let all the stuff hit our drainage system, and we let it sit on our properties, our highways, 35, 410, everywhere. There's mattresses, bottles, plastic, you name it. You can see it anywhere. And what's more concerning and alarming is that we've got this growing issue of panhandling and the homeless people. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Sparza. Simona Sparza, followed by Mayling Neptu. Simon Sparza, Mayling Neptuha. I think that then concludes our citizens to be heard. Thank you, everybody.